Thank you for that. If you knew how beautiful it sounds to sit on the front row and for us to sing that song before I come up here, it's just such a joy. Our text this morning comes from Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 25 through 27. Ephesians chapter 5, beginning with verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy without blemish. There are lots of people today that are very critical of the church, many times the Lord's church, and take often cheap shots, as we will say, about uh, the, uh, the church. Often, of course, they do it out of ignorance. They really don't know what they're talking about, frankly. Out of prejudice. In other words, I'm prejudging things again that I'm, I don't really know. Out of resentment, out of disobedience. You know, if I don't want to obey the Lord, I can find something to criticize with uh, the direction I ought to be going. And I'm talking this morning not about substitutes for the Lord's church, but I'm talking about the church of Scripture. And this morning I want to say there is much right about the church. Much right about the church. And I want to share with you five things that I think are absolutely so wonderful and beautiful about the church. They all start with an F if you'd like to follow along in your thinking with me. First of all, its foundation is right. Everything must have a proper foundation. You remember the passage at the very end of the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 7 verses 24 through 27. The Lord talked about the simple analogy of a man or two men building a house. One built upon the sand. And it was a sorry foundation and obviously the house fell when the storms came. But another one was built upon the rock. And the winds came, the floods, all of, the, the, uh, all of nature and its uh, uh, attack upon this house. It did not fall because why? The foundation was sure. And uh, that's what we're talking here about with the solid foundation of the church. And of course, that church was built on the foundation of faith in Jesus Christ. The classic passage is found in Matthew chapter 16, verses 15 through 19. The great confession was made by the Apostle Peter. I believe that you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then the Lord used that great confession as a means of putting down the foundation for his church. It's one of only two places found in the gospel where the church is mentioned. But he says, upon this rock, upon this faith that you have in me, I will build this wonderful institution. I will put my, uh, my, my headship over that body that's built on that foundation. What a wonderful thought. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 11 makes, it, it makes the point the same way when it says there is no other foundation but Jesus Christ. No other way of putting down something that will hold the weight of the Lord's church than that faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. The analogy or the comparison changes somewhat in Ephesians chapter 2 verses 20 and 21 where here you have the foundation of the church being the apostles and prophets. Now that's no conflict really because those apostles of Jesus Christ and those prophets that were revealing his will were a part of the foundation itself. They were giving what the Lord wanted for his foundation. So there's absolutely no uh, contradiction, if you will, with that uh, uh, change of analogy. They were presenting, revealing simply what the Lord wanted for his church. Number two, the focus is right for the Lord's church. 
The primary focus and then the purpose and the aim of the church should be, must be, and is the Lord's focus. The salvation of lost souls. Souls in the eyes of God are totally invaluable. Matthew chapter 16, verse 26. What would a man give in exchange for his soul? I want to tell you on Judgment Day, you could have all of this life with all of its wonderful possessions and you wouldn't give them for your eternal soul. And then he turns around again in that same verse. He wouldn't give the world and lose his soul. It's just that simple. So it's of infinite value. And the Lord knows that value. And he knows it for us if sometime we forget it. And live below that spiritual life that the Lord has for us. The Lord's mission was clearly stated in Luke chapter 19 verse 10. In fact, many look at this verse and say it's the whole theme of the gospel of Luke. Luke 19.10, the Lord came to seek and to save that which was lost. That was his aim. That was his focus. And therefore, the church's response today and was in the first century that very thing. And that response was seen, for instance, in Acts chapter 2 and verse 42 on the day of Pentecost when the church first began. It says there that they baptized 3,000 people. Why? Because that was the means of saving their souls. And they kept that focus uh, in our Sunday morning Bible class in in the auditorium here. We uh, are going through the wonderful book of Acts and seeing over and over again, that focus of that early church. And that church of the 21st century needs to have the same one. And you know, we always, as, have, as human beings, have the possibility of losing our focus, of being out of focus. And probably the primary way we do that is turning that outward thrust to something inward. And start thinking just about ourselves. And thinking, what do we need rather than that lost world? And saving souls within and without the church. And just becoming more of a a social institution. Church was never to be that. But its focus should be saving lost souls in and out of the church. Number three. It's faith is right. And here I want to use the expression faith as it's often used in scripture of doctrines, of the teachings of the church. And the word faith is, as I say, so often used that way. Let me give you some examples. Acts chapter 6 verse 7. The priest, the Jewish priest, as the church is spreading out into the world, were obedient to the faith. They responded in obedience to the faith of the teachings of the church and of the Lord. Again in Acts 14, verse 27, continue in the faith. The church there was told, continue in the faith. Uh, It's used, for instance, in, again, Acts 16, verse 5. The churches were established, again, on that solid rock. They continue to be established in the faith. Uh, 1 uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4 verse 1 makes the tragic point that some shall depart from that faith. In other words, they'll leave the faith. They'll go back to the world or go into false teaching or whatever. And that was a prediction of that time. Now, is doctrine important? I would imagine there are millions of people that would answer, no, 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 no. The doctrines, the teachings uh, don't make any difference. You can, you can believe what you want, essentially. There's this broad umbrella for the church and for uh, Christianity. And, and, you know, you go your way, I go mine. You believe what you want, I believe my, my way. Is that really how to deal with teachings? I think the key verse that you would easily find and understand with that in mind is 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 4, uh, 16. Let me quote it. Take heed. In other words, pay attention. Give your earnest uh, uh, focus on this. Take heed 
to yourself and to your doctrine, your teaching. Continue in them, for in doing this, you will save both yourself and those who hear you. Doctrine important? Well, it'll just save me, and it will save those with whom I have uh, communication. It's critically important to think in those terms. And when you put all of that teaching together, the ultimate message is Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 8 and verse 35, the uh, evangelist Philip, in connecting with the, the uh, queen's treasurer, began at the scripture that man was reading at the time, and he preached unto him Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus is the fundamental message of the gospel and of that faith. Number four, it's fellowship is right. Now the word fellowship is simply put, what we share as partners in Christ. Now that's a big statement. The things that we share in a partnership in Christ, not outside of Christ. You know, we can have all kinds of friendships and associations and connections and enjoy them and have all kinds of good positive experiences. That's fine. But we're talking here about Christian fellowship. And uh, the point is, in 1 John 1 verse 7, the understanding of fellowship is so clear in this, this section. It says that fellowship is triangular. Think triangle. And here's how it works. The passage says, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, then we have fellowship. There's the word, fellowship, one with another. All right, now here's the triangle. If I have fellowship with the Lord, if I am in a proper spiritual relationship with the Lord, and you are in a special spiritual relationship with the Lord, when you have those two sides of the triangle, then we can connect them together and we can have that fellowship. If we walk, you and I walk in that light, then we can have fellowship one with another. They connect up. And then and only then can we have that fellowship, walking in the light together. Now that can be as individuals, that can be as a group, church to church. We can be in fellowship with people around the world. If we walk in the light and they walk in the light, then we can be together in this wonderful experience of fellowship. And my friends, fellowship is the lifeblood of the church. Acts chapter 2 and verse 42, as the, the church is just beginning, the inspired writer in summing up what was happening in those very early days says, they continued in the fellowship and the apostles' doctrine. I mean, at the very outset, the Lord, Lord wants us to know how important that experience, that partnership and sharing was in the early church. Philippians chapter 1 verse 15 reminds us, your fellowship in the gospel. You know, really what ties us together is the good news of Jesus Christ. And as we learn that message and as we obey the gospel, then we share in that fellowship together. Paul was writing that, by the way, to the Philippian Christians. They were hundreds of miles away from Paul who was in the Roman prison. And yet he's saying, we have a fellowship in the good news. What a wonderful thought that is. Our, our campaigners went to uh, Texas this last week. And they were in fellowship with a lot of different people from various parts of the, of the country. A few out of the country even. And... Uh, and also with the brethren down there in that particular congregation. That's fellowship. That's partnering together uh, in, uh, in the gospel. And that, of course, means that we suffer with one another. 1 Corinthians 12, 26. We rejoice when our brothers and sisters are honored. Romans chapter 12, verse 15. When we bear one another's burdens. Galatians 6, 2. We are in fellowship and sharing. When we pray for one another, we did that this morning. Romans chapter 15, verse 30. 
when we encourage one another. Romans chapter 1 verse 12. And on and on I could go with that. And the various things that make our fellowship grand. We appreciate it so much. Fellowship has to do, first of all, with people. People, human beings. It has to do with principles. In other words, I can't fellowship people that are not following the will of God. That, that's a principle. We cannot, with certain practices that are going on. In the early church, there were people that were immoral and were living like the world. Well, the church couldn't fellowship those people. You find some examples of that with Paul where he says, you know, you need to withdraw from those people. They are immoral in their, in their behavior. Uh, it's a matter of position. Again, it's, this has to do with what we're talking about with uh, walking in the light. And if my position is in Christ, then I can't have fellowship with those that are outside of Christ. Number five, its future is right. I want to tell you the Lord is coming again for his church. 1 Corinthians 15, 24 says that he will deliver up the kingdom to God the Father at the end of time. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17 make the point that when the Lord comes in the heavens, the dead in Christ will rise first. Then those that are alive when he comes will be caught up with them together to be with the Lord forever. That's the promise. And so the church is in the future. The church with its glorious uh, future out there is uh, a part of God's plan. We must live, of course, with that expectation. John chapter 12, verse 48, is a sobering warning. It says at the last day, in other words, the last day of this, this world and, and this period of time, if you will. This last, the, the last day, we'll, we'll have some things happening. The Lord begins by saying, those that reject me and do not receive my word will be judged... In the last day, that is judgment day. And by what measure? Well, he repeats again this. The word, the message that I have spoken will judge in the last day. That means for everyone, judgment day is coming. We want to be in that precious body of Christ. To be saved and right with him when that future coming is upon us which is an uncertain time. It will come, the scriptures say, as a thief in the night. But the future for God's people is absolutely sure. In fact, one of the most beautiful passages of all with that in mind is Colossians chapter 3 and verse 4. When he appears, when Christ appears, we will appear with him in glory. Glory is coming. And we human beings that are part of the church, can share that glory with him. My friends, the place for you is in that church. Are you in that body of Christ this morning? Are you right with God? Have you been born again of the water and the spirit? Have you given your life to the Lord in faith and obedience? Are you willing to confess your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ as the Son of God? Are you willing to repent of your sins and go to the, war, to the Lord with your faith? Be baptized for the remission of your sins. If we can assist you in that, if you need the prayers of the Lord's people this morning, if you'd like to place your membership with us, we want to give you the opportunity to do that now. Won't you come while together we stand and sing?